I'd like to walk you through the format just before we get started. Um, this is going to be a conversation. I, I really sincerely believe that we have a chance to have Sam here uh, as a, a mentor. So I want to treat this kind of like, you know, I'm just going for coffee with my buddy Sam. Uh, he's going to go give me some advice about life. And just to set the tone and to cement our, our new status as, as uh, best buddies, I have hats here, um, that one for you. I need something to cover my head. Actually, here, this one's for you. <laughs> Zell and Cooperman, best buds. <laughs> so, time permitting, I'd like to cover so topics including uh, your investing style, your philosophy on life and philanthropy. We'll stop to take some questions along the way. We, we do have a lot to get through, so uh, hopefully we can get right into it. Um, starting, I guess, just with trying to get to know you a little bit. So you're a, you're a born entrepreneur, and I think you discovered this at a pretty young age. Do uh, you mind sharing uh, a story that I heard uh, about when you really, in your early teens, where you discovered your entrepreneurial muscle? <laughs> I. Uh... I'm an immigrant's kid, and my parents came to the United States uh, about 90 days before I was born. Uh, and they uh, had an extensive Jewish background. And so I started going to Hebrew school when I was five, and I graduated when I was 11. And then my parents moved to the suburbs. And uh, there wasn't anything that I could uh, continue my Jewish education. And so I ended up going back to the city every day after school um, and going to a yeshiva, which was a higher learning uh, body. And I didn't like the yeshiva very much, uh, but I loved being 12 years old and wandering around the city of Chicago and just looking at all the stuff that was going on. And, uh, and in the process, uh, I discovered that there were uh, magazine stands underneath the L tracks and that the magazine stands underneath the L tracks sold different kind of stuff than they sold in the magazine stands in the suburbs and and I was 12 years old and uh, I was very good at looking at the pictures and uh, and then in 1953 about a couple months after I went start going back to school Hugh Hefner came out with a new magazine called Playboy and uh, it was really awesome compared to the other stuff that was there <laughs> and uh, so I bought it for 50 cents and then I read it on the way home and then when I got back to the suburbs I showed it to some friends of mine and they needless to say also shared my enthusiasm for it <laughs> uh, and they said gee uh, can I buy it and uh, I said yeah, and so I sold the first one for three bucks. Um, I then recognized, you know, uh, you know, when I took Econ 101 at the University of Michigan, uh, the most relevant thing I ever learned was what I saw on the first day, which was on the blackboard it said supply and demand. And I looked at the situation and I said, gee, uh, there is no supply and I think there's unlimited demand. <laughs> so. I went into the export-import business and uh, proceeded to buy Playboy in the, in the city and resell it to my friends, and then I kind of figured out I was an entrepreneur. Okay, which leads perfectly to the next question. It's funny, so my next question is that the Forbes 400 gave you a self-made score of 8 out of 10, uh, 10 being reserved for people who grew up out of poverty, and now, now we know how your self-made started. Um, when you got a little bit older, how did, how did you evolve and how did you get started in your real estate career and, and everything else that followed from that? Um, I've always uh, been interested in business and interested in how things fit together and, uh, uh, and I was perpetually kind of starting businesses and uh, I had a friend of mine at the university uh, who lived in a house and uh, I went to see him one night and he said that the guy who owned the house had been there the night before and he had bought the house next door and was going to build a 15 unit apartment building. And my immediate reaction was, well, why don't we go pitch them? We're students. These are for student apartments. Uh, we ought to know what they want and we'll manage it and we'll each get a free apartment. And so we went and made up a little brochure and we pitched them and they bought our act. 
So we, as a junior, early in my junior year, we started working on this project, which was finished by the time I graduated as a senior. And uh, we rented it, we just helped design it, we bought the furniture, um, and it worked. And so then they gave us another building, and then somebody else gave us a building, and then we started buying buildings. And uh, so by the time I graduated from law school, um, I think we managed a couple thousand apartments, and uh, we owned about 20 buildings, and uh, had a good time. Actually, law school was the biggest fucking bore of my life. <laughs> so um, the, real, the real motivation for this business was uh, I knew that the only way that I could get through law school was if I had something that really distracted me and eliminated the boredom of going to school. Just somewhere along the line, you start, so you start off managing these things, and somewhere along the line, you're buying buildings, yeah. you've got to start taking risk. And so, I guess it relates to you today and also but back then, how do you sleep at night? Like, was there ever a moment where, you know, you're going and you're buying these buildings and you're taking risk and I guess you're using leverage. It was always just a clear, uh, a clear decision, a clear easy path for you or, or were there moments when there were, there were doubts and... Uh... Oh, I think anybody uh, who doesn't acknowledge the fact that there are various points uh, of, you know, great concern or, uh, you know, concern about risk. Uh, I had, obviously, I've had many of them over 50 years, and they're all kind of different. But uh, in the end, I mean, I, I, I do a, quite a bit of speaking about entrepreneurship. And, and you know, the, the real measure of an entrepreneur uh, starts with some kind of a level of self-confidence. Uh, I tell people that, you know, everybody can see problems. Entrepreneurs see problems, but also see solutions. And right or wrong, uh, I've always had a lot of confidence in my judgments. Uh, and most of the time, uh, it's worked out. Well, if you keep it up, you might actually be successful. Yeah, you'd get rich. Um, so, okay, you're the, the founding father of the modern REIT. Um, and I guess if people, if, if the Sam Zell brand, I mean, that's what people might think of uh, right away. But the fact is, is that what most people don't know is that you've been very successful across a, a range of industries. And I mean, Prime Quadrant is an, in, it's an investment consulting firm, right? So most people here, I think, are concerned about asset allocation. And I think now you're probably 70%, I think was the number that I heard, not uh, Non real estate. estate. Yeah. So do you want to maybe comment just on how that asset allocation came to be and, and um, your, yeah. your philosophy um, on asset allocation? You know, we obviously started in the real estate business. Um, I graduated from law school. Uh, I had a kind of a come to Jesus meeting with myself and because I really had to figure out what I was going to do. Uh, I was in Ann Arbor. Uh, I made $150,000 my senior year in law school. Uh, I had a growing business. Uh, and I could stay in Ann Arbor and I would be a big fish in a small pond. Um, I spent my whole life testing my limits. And uh, this was no different. And so I sold everything and uh, moved to Chicago to see if I could play with the big boys. And uh, that's really the evolution uh, of me coming to Chicago. And we spent the next 12, 13 years in the real estate business. And then in 1980, the real estate business, commercial real estate business in the United States, uh, was less attractive in my, in our opinion. And so I sat down with my partner and uh, we talked about it and we said, you know, we've been very successful, but, and we've been very successful in real estate, but I don't know how you can be successful in real estate unless you're also a successful businessman. And if you're a successful businessman, then why wouldn't the same principles that uh, led us to be successful in the real estate space not be applicable to other arenas. So in 1980, uh, we kind of decided that our goal for the next 10 years would be to defeat 50-50 by 1990. And so we started doing a lot of different kinds of transactions in different businesses. But the reality was that the basic principles, supply, demand, market share, uh, et cetera, et cetera, were applicable whether it was real estate or non-real estate. And so we built an agricultural chemicals business uh, from scratch by buying a nitrogen facility at a bankruptcy, 
buying a distribution facility from somebody who was liquidating it. Then we came to Canada and bought Kalium, which was a potash miner. We rolled it all together. We took it public uh, as an agricultural chemicals business. Uh, the principles and the decisions that we made in putting that together weren't really very different from everything else that we had previously done. And we applied that in different industries. We consolidated the container leasing business. We consolidated the rail car leasing business. Uh, we just did a lot of different stuff. But the principles were really simple, really the same. Uh, I'm not a great believer in uh, you know, esoteric management theses or anything like that. I think everything, uh, the, the quality of every decision is probably directly related to the simplicity in making the decision. Right. And the more complex the decision re is required, the less likely of it, uh, of it, pr of it proving, proving uh, meritorious. And you didn't, okay, so I, you didn't set out and say, look, I want to have X percent in stocks and X percent in bonds and X percent in private equity. I'm a professional opportunist. Right. And as a professional opportunist, what I responded to was what the world gave me to respond to as opposed to setting out and saying, I want to have so much in this and so much in that. I didn't have any money, uh, so I didn't really have much of an allocation problem. Right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, we, we will get to Sam Zell, the talking head, and, and ask your opinion on, on the economy and everything else. But first, I, wa I want to talk about something that I think is just, it speaks, I think it speaks volumes about you. We'll find out now. But you send out a, an awesome year-end gift to your friends and business associates. And now that we're best friends, I'm, I'll, right. I'll be expecting mine. Right. Um, can you tell us about this year-end gift and, and I guess how, you know, what it is and how it evolved? Yeah, um, in 1976, um, my business evolved to the point where I was getting pens and pencils and calendars and grapefruits and chocolate at Christmas every year. And uh, I, I, I couldn't get my head around the idea that I was going to send somebody a calendar with my name on it. And so I thought about it and I said, you know, I'm going to just send people where my head is every year. So that first year, I sent everybody a Lucite block with my company logo on it and a Samism. And the Samism was, we suffer from knowing the numbers. And it was a reflection of the fact that at that particular time, uh, there was a lot of, quote, enthusiasm uh, that I didn't agree to and didn't agree with, and I was suffering because everybody else was doing deals, and I suffered from knowing the numbers. And uh, so that's how it started. And somewhere, uh, I guess in 19, and each year I kept sending, and, and they kept getting a little more elaborate, and a little more elaborate. And then in 1990, uh, at the depths of the US real estate recession, uh, I gave a speech, and uh, uh, I had been, for the 10 years before that, basically telling everybody that the end of the world was coming. And of course, nobody believed me. Uh, and so everybody expected that I was going to get up and piss on the world again. And instead, I got up and said, this is the greatest single opportunity in your lifetime. Uh, you're going to be able to buy assets at 40 cents on the dollar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We have a massive oversupply. The market's got to get cleared. Uh, and I ended the speech by uh, saying, you got to stay alive till 95. And that became the mantra of the real estate industry. And uh, so when December 31st, 1994 came, uh, I created my year-end gift. And what it was was a an office building on a tilt uh, with a whole bunch of men pushing up on it. Uh, and, uh, and the song that was part of the thing came from the Bee Gees, and it was called Staying Alive Till 95. And uh, that was the first of what has now been another 15, 16 years of musical boxes that reflect where my head is at. And, uh, these musical boxes, I, I, we're going to show you uh, a quick 
uh, clip of one that, uh, so you can see what, I mean, they're very elaborate. How many do you uh, produce? 675. Okay. So just, just keep this in mind, all right? There's 675 of these things are made, and they're not little rinky dinky. These are very creative music boxes. So <laughs> they're made. They're made by a firm in California for me, uh, that are that were the model makers for George Lucas uh, in the Star Wars. So, okay. so that, may, that now makes sense. Stuff. So uh, in a second, we're gonna we're gonna show a short clip from the 2007 one. Uh, you'll see it's timely, called Confusion, uh, or I guess Credit Confusion. And uh, the sound on the clip that I have is not great, so I'm gonna read. This is an intro in Sam's voice. So you, you open this music box. Okay, it's it opens mechanically, and this is Sam's voice. It says. So why were you surprised? When risk disappears from underwriting standards, can potholes be far behind? When greed defeats fear, the pigs get slaughtered. And then he says some more stuff, and then he says, the reemergence of equity will slowly un- Wishing oh, you a healthy, happy, and prosperous new year. So there, you get the idea. I mean, these things, and this is, you, you write all the lyrics, right? I write them with, with a, somebody, yeah. Uh, and one of these go out every year, and uh, I'm going somewhere where all of this. I mean, um, this goes to speak to your impeccable sense of timing. So in 1999, you put out a music box called The Emperor Has No Clothes, and it's kind of a, a bronze statue of a tech geek standing naked uh, on top of a pile of Wall Street journals and a ticker tape that is littered with a whole bunch of companies that are now gone, tech companies that are now gone. Dot com companies. Dot com companies. And um, the quote that you used that year, you said, one of the things you said was, this musical fable doesn't question technology, it just questions valuation. New technology will change our lives, but it will not change the basic laws of economics. Uh, so one of the things that I've loved so far about you know preparing for this is that everything you say is just makes perfect sense, and I guess you know it's hard in hindsight. You know, for the rest of us mere mortals, it makes perfect sense in hindsight, but I guess it made perfect sense to you at the time. Um, in 2007, when you were busy thinking about what to, what you were going to put in your 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 2007 music box, you sold your whole office portfolio to Blackstone for 39 billion dollars. So you were putting your money where your mouth is. Okay, your timing was impeccable. And I guess that uh, leads us to, you know, ask if you're prepared to share your thoughts for what, what, what's going into Music Box 2015. Ah, uh, I don't give any advance notice. Okay, all right, so then fine. I suspected you might say that, so I'm just going to attack it from a few different, a few different directions. Um, it really goes to speak to your macro view of the world. So um, I think that uh, when you, when I look at the world today, um, and, and by the way, the world is the whole world, not just the U.S. or Canada. I think the single biggest issue worldwide is lack of demand. Uh, where's the demand going to come from? Where is growth going to come from uh, to basically, you know, uh, recapture uh, the status of the world previous to the financial crisis? Um, in 1944, uh, before the end of World War II, the Allies got together uh, expecting to win, and they had a conference in Bretton Woods. And uh, that conference effectively was focused on creating stable currencies, uh, because they recognized that without stable currencies, you could not have worldwide growth in trade. And, if, and the only way that the world was going to recover from World War II was a dramatic expansion in world trade. And that could not happen uh, without stable currencies. From 1944 until about 18 months ago, with a couple of exceptions, uh, we had those stable currencies. Uh, in the last 18 months, um, I think we've had uh, a very, very unstable environment uh, that I think is very dangerous. 
you know, just look at, uh, you know, the ruble is down 65%, the Brazil real is down 65%, the euro is down 35%, the yen is down 40%. Now, all of these are against the dollar, but that's the reality of the reserve currency. And I think that, uh, and at the same time, we've seen uh, world trade slow down. And, it, and just like, you know, we as human beings began in the, in the barter business, we would trade you, you know, a stack of uh, grapes for a stack of oranges or something. Uh, by definition, that had very limiting impacts. So the question was, how was the world going to evolve? And obviously currencies were the answer. But when we have the kind of instability in the currency world that we have today, I think the, the environment is dangerous. Uh, I think the environment is uh, likely to perpetuate slow growth. And slow growth uh, is not a formula that is likely to produce very positive results in the future. So what do you do in that environment? Uh, grab your ass. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think you need to be very careful. Um, I think that all this QE2 stuff and uh, what they're doing at the ACB, this, you know, you know et cetera, um, I think is, we're creating uh, potential bubbles and potential issues and problems that uh, I think need to be addressed. Uh, I think that uh, the naivete is that we've done it and got away with it without any, at least near-term, implications. Uh, but anybody who makes decisions based on short-term decisions suffers from it accordingly. And I think that, you know, worldwide, uh, we have to get everything back on track uh, or we're going to just slow down further. And I think that is going to create all kinds of problems worldwide. Okay. I, I might come back to that, but I, I did want to uh, get your view. Um, with respect to U.S. real estate and to the extent that it applies to Canadian real estate, um, I know you have some interesting views just on... Well, I think that, uh, you know, first of all, I think it's important to start when you talk about real estate to notice or to, to recognize that uh, the 2007 uh, financial crisis was the first time since World War II where the U.S. went into a recession and real estate, commercial real estate, was not in oversupply. Only time. Every other time, uh, real estate kind of led the U.S. into the various recessions. So, and that combined with pretend and extend, which was another way of not facing up and not marking to market, uh, basically, uh, I think, stopped development. Uh, the fact that the lenders didn't foreclose meant that everybody kind of stood in place and we came out of that period um, and, and, and yet we don't have enough demand uh, to justify a lot of new construction, but a lot of new construction we haven't. So I think that uh, the current U.S. real estate market is in pretty good shape. I think the Canadian real estate market is currently in pretty good shape, but I think both of them are facing significant supply um, and at a time when there's not significant demand. Right. And so I guess you, you, you did just sell a good chunk of suburban um, uh, real estate, multifamily real estate to Starwood, to Barry Sternlicht. Yeah, we announced that deal about three weeks ago and it was $5.375 billion on uh, 23,000 apartments. But that was not an attempt to call a top uh, or anything like that. Um, you know, we took that company public in 1993. It was all uh, a suburban garden apartment project. Uh, at that time, the definition of a very good in suburban apartment project was expressway exposure. Um, somewhere in the late 90s, uh, we decided that that was not the answer. And so we began the shift of moving uh, from suburban garden apartments into CBD high-rise apartments. And, uh, and, and where instead of expressway frontage, it became a question of what's the walking score? 
how far are you from Starbucks, how far are you from the subway, how far are you from the gym. Uh, and so the transaction we announced with uh, Barry Sternlick was basically we've been telling everybody that we were going to complete this transaction or complete this trans transition from suburban to urban. Um, and we expected to do it over another few years. And then we had a bid uh, for everything that wasn't what we wanted to own. And uh, we hit it. Okay, so it's not necessarily that you're a seller more than a buyer now. Uh, I think you know. I think the buyer in this particular case, uh, you know, bought uh, well occupied, well maintained, fully you know, cash flowing assets uh, at a rate that was probably five. But in today's world, uh, you can leverage that at four or three and three quarters, depending on whether you want to how you want to play the game. Uh, and so you can, in effect make this transaction and the buyer can have a positive cash flow uh, and we can in effect complete uh, the transition from suburban to urban. To urban, right. Um, okay, you mentioned I guess uh, cap rate spread trade where you're, you're you know, you can borrow pretty cheap. So do you have a, a, an opinion on the impact of long-term uh, interest rates uh, uh, being so low and... and uh... Well, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, um, one of my one of the guys who works for me came to me uh, about seven or eight years ago with this extraordinary short idea, and he explained to me that the company didn't think it was going to make it. And it was a great opportunity, and there was only one problem with the proposal, and that was the stock was trading for a dollar, so it could go to zero. But if you short something at a dollar, it could also go to ten. Right. So from a risk reward point of view, I said, your thesis may be right, but the amount you can get for taking the risk is not sufficient. Uh, that's kind of the way I look at the real estate market today. Um, I'm looking at B quality assets that are trading at four or three or five percent. Uh, and I think about you know, the impact of interest rates uh, basically creating a, uh, a, a semi-benign environment for leverage and, and perspective. And uh, I think the risk-reward ratio is out of line. And uh, so it's very hard for me to, as a long-term investor, to in effect put you know, significant capital to work at rates of return that I don't think are adequate. Right. So uh, is that different? Because uh, you're spending quite a bit of time in the emerging markets, I think. Yes. And so is it a different story um, over there? And what's um, I think that, uh, you know, we have uh, been involved in real estate platforms in various emerging markets. Uh, we've tended to move from market to market uh, as we see opportunities. Uh, but the thing that attracted us to the emerging markets was that's the only place in the world where we saw growth. And even today, uh, the growth in most of the emerging markets is, by historical standards, inadequate, but still double uh, what it is in the developed world. And in some parts of the developed world, it's four times as high. So ultimately, it's very hard to make money uh, unless there is demand. And uh, so our focus is, where's the demand and how can we respond to it and, and create opportunities to benefit from it? So then how do you successfully um, invest in the, uh, I guess there's two sides to it. How do you successfully invest in, in emerging markets and how does a schlepper like I, like me, successfully invest in uh, well, emerging markets? Well, I, I've never been a schlepper, so I don't know how to answer your question. <laughs> Well, you, you set me up. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. I, I, do you know what? I'm going to have to take the hat back. Yeah, here. <laughs> um, you know, our premise was very simple. First and foremost, uh, you don't go anywhere without a partner, a local partner, uh, because anybody who's naive enough to think that they could go into a court in Brazil as a U.S. guy and say, well, this guy screwed me. Uh, no chance. I've been hometowned too many different times. Uh, and, it, and by the way, you don't have to be an emerging market to get hometown. Try investing in France. Uh, you know, if you're not a, a French, uh, the rules are very different. So everywhere we went, first and foremost was 
who's our partner? And can I, that partner uh, both protect us from the local environment, help us interpret the local environment, and have enough skin in the game uh, so that we both are have an aligned positions? And you know, we've been, and then historically, when we've been investing in the emerging markets, we've also tended to follow themes. So uh, early on, we started in 1997, uh, and the first country we invested in was Mexico. And, and the motivation for investing in Mexico was that they had gone through the tequila crisis in 94. Uh, they were slowly recovering. Uh, and they were, give or take, a year or two from achieving investment grade. Uh, there is no time in any country's life where it is more disciplined than when they are close to investment grade. And so we benefited from all kinds of new uh, transparency, and the Mexican government was just terrific, and they were telling everybody what the reserves were, and, and the Mexican peso went up, and it was terrific opportunity. And then we moved from there to Brazil and rode the next three years until they became investment grade. And then we went to Colombia and followed the same pattern. So, you know, the macro scenario in any one of these countries is really critical to whether it's, it's a place you want to put your money. And obviously, uh, you've got to focus on the fact that ultimately every investment has to have an exit. Yeah. And so when you start investing in, quote, emerging markets, uh, it's really important to focus on how you're going to get out. And, and local capital markets uh, are a very important element. So the fact that there's a Mexican stock exchange and a Brazilian stock exchange, and, and during these periods, uh, uh, they had significantly more liquidity, which gave us opportunities to do stuff that we would not have been able to do if those capital markets were not at least as developed as they were. Right. Okay, so these markets are more volatile, so I guess you're moving, you know, it sounds like you move f fairly rapidly sure. through them. Um, and so can you comment where you're looking, if anywhere, now? I mean, is there anything that makes sense today? Um, I think that, uh, you know, there are a lot of places that make sense. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the, the basic premises that I operate under is that uh, I've always had an enormous respect and fear of competition. And so uh, the focus has always been how do we invest, and that's probably why we're contrarians, where uh, how do we invest in a scenario uh, where we don't get sucked up by the competition? I mean, philosophically, I really like monopolies. Uh, if I can't have a monopoly, I'll settle for an oligopoly. Uh, but competition is terrific for you, not for me. So uh, one of the interesting parts of the emerging markets right now is that in a country like Brazil, uh, five years ago, uh, I couldn't get a hotel room in Sao Paulo because there were so many investment bankers from New York. Now I can shoot a cannon through the hotel and there's nobody there. So in the end, the quality of the investment opportunity is much more related to whether you have to compete uh, in order to achieve it or whether you can design the transaction. And I think in the kind of environment of the emerging markets today, particularly with you know, the European banks uh, basically provided about 62% of all the capital in the emerging markets over the last 15 years. Uh, the problems in Europe, uh, I mean, from my perspective, said, you know, these guys are going to protect their home markets, you know, a long time before they worry about their subsidiary in Brazil. So uh, there's been a huge sucking sound of capital coming out of the emerging markets, creating uh, levels of opportunity and distress. Right. And so uh, maybe the prospects for Brazil aren't as good today as they were five years ago, but the price of entry is significantly different than it was five years ago. Okay. I'd like to switch gears just for, for a second. I mean, you had the Republican uh, debate uh, a couple of nights ago. Um, how important is the U.S. Pres presidential election next year, and, and what do you think needs to happen? I mean, uh, uh, I think the, I think the uh, election is critical. 
Uh, I think that uh, the last seven years have been a disaster for the United States, and frankly, I think a disaster for the world. Uh, if the United States does not lead, uh, as we have now found out, uh, there isn't anybody else who steps up and leads, except maybe Putin, and he's leading in the wrong direction. So a weak United States is a weak world and a, and a very dangerous and difficult world to, to work in. Um, I, I know Barack Obama, he was in my house for dinner. Uh, he's a very smart guy, but he's an ideologue. And, and ideologues don't make good leaders. Leaders are people who are capable of understanding and finding methodologies to bring people together, not to say my way or the highway. Okay, I'm, I'm not. Gonna... I could be subtler if you want me to. <laughs> huh? <laughs> well, I'm not gonna. I won't put you on the spot and ask you on the Republican side who who you think would be good, unless you want to answer that. But but I will say that immigration's an issue. Yep. And you had a beautiful take that I that I that I heard on on the immigration question. So well, I like... mean, uh, uh, I, I've always had a very consistent attitude about immigration. Uh, I'm a. I was born 90 days after my parents came to the United States. Uh, I believe very strongly that uh, the, the reason that the United States has grown uh, the way it has is because of its enormous uh, immigrant base. Uh, immigration, almost by definition, is a self-selecting process. I mean, my parents escaped from Poland in August of 1939. Uh, before they left, uh, they each had five siblings, pleaded with them to go with them. Uh, none of them would go. Uh, they all died in the Holocaust. Uh, and so uh, those people who had the balls to take the risk and go out and, and say, I've got to get there, uh, are the people that helped build the United States and the people that helped build Canada. So I think uh, any country that uh, does not have a strong immigration policy uh, is, is, is uh, operating against their own interests. And uh, I think that uh, the United States uh, has evolved from uh, a welcoming Ellis Island uh, uh, to the refugees and, and, and the, the, you know, the people in the world. And we've gone from that to you know, defining immigration as grandmothers. And uh, I think that's uh, both stupid and, and very deleterious to the future of America. So uh, I think that all this build a wall and uh, all the rest of this crap is nothing more than crap. So just on that point, um, uh, quickly, the wall. Everybody's talking about building a wall and you're building a bridge. Yes. Uh, you want to talk about the bridge? Well, um, actually what I should share with all of you is that, you know, and, and most of the time, uh, you know, I don't really uh, confess to the fact that I have been a liar for many years. but. Uh, in this particular case, uh, that's really an accurate statement because I went around and often times told people that I had a bridge to sell them. Uh, the problem was that I really didn't. Uh, but now I'm building a bridge, and so now I no longer have to lie to people. When I say I got a bridge to sell you, I actually have a bridge. And we're building a bridge which is literally a couple of weeks from being opened, uh, and it's on the Mexican border in California. And at that particular point in the border, which is Chula Vista, uh, if you go over to the Mexican side, what you have are the runway of the Tijuana airport. And so the bridge literally goes across the border and into the Tijuana airport. So right now there are about three million Americans who fly in and out of Tijuana. Uh, one of the reasons is that airfares are, give or take, 35% cheaper going out of Tijuana than they would be out of LA. Uh, those three million people today have to go through the border crossing, which takes anywhere from an hour to three hours. Uh, and then you've got to drive through Tijuana for 12 miles to get to the airport. Uh, when this bridge opens, you'll basically drive uh, within the United States, park your car there, walk across the bridge, and on the other side of the bridge are the ticket counters uh, for the airlines. And uh, we hope it's going to be very successful. Okay, so you're still a liar, by the way, because that bridge is going to be a monopoly, so I suspect you won't want to sell It's for sure going to be a monopoly. That's why I did it. <laughs>
So it's not and for I sale. Think, and I think there's very little risk that anybody's going to build one next door. Right. <laughs> okay, so this is your warning. We have 20 minutes left. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to try and take some questions, and then I'd like to, hopefully, there will be time to hit a few Samisms at the end. So I'm going to ask two more questions, and then we're going to open up. So now's your time to think about questions you want to ask, Sam. But, you know, this crowd, uh, uh, there are a lot of people in this room who are very, very philanthropic, so I think they would benefit from hearing your views on th philanthropy. Um, first of all, uh, you know, philanthropy has always been a stellar element of, of our whole family. I mean, it's always been, you know, part of the process and part of what we think about. Um, Initially, I didn't have much of a problem with philanthropy because I didn't have any money. Um, things have changed. I, you know, I like to tell people that when I was a student at the university, they didn't really care much about me and certainly not, didn't pay much attention. But recently, they've seemed to have taken a much greater interest in me than <laughs> they did when I was a student. But um, I guess I've learned a lot of things. I mean, initially, I kind of spread things around and, and realized that I could never make a difference. Uh, unless I was willing to concentrate. Uh, I also believe very strongly that anybody can put their name on a building. Uh, and that was not appealing to me. Uh, what I wanted to do was create uh, methodologies to make a difference, to change things. And one of the areas that uh, I'm really obsessed about is entrepreneurship, uh, which kind of goes with the immigration issue, because it's the same yep. issue. And uh, so I started uh, a program both in Israel uh, and at the University of Michigan in entrepreneurship. And in, in, in Ann Arbor, it's much more of an academic-oriented program uh, with you know, various pieces, creating companies or managing portfolios and stuff like that. In Israel, um, what we did is we created a program that took uh, 22 kids a year, broke them up into teams, and then they created uh, companies in the classroom. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, in the 15 years uh, that the program has been in place, uh, we've had uh, $250 million of monetizations of companies created in the classroom. Uh, and, and in terms of both my involvement in the program, and I'm very much involved in it, because ultimately just writing a check, uh, you know, look what happened to the Ford Foundation. You know, uh, Henry Ford has been turning over in his grave for 40 years because he created a Ford Foundation that basically did everything that was just the opposite of anything he believed in. Uh, so my orientation is not only to provide funding, but also to be involved. And uh, so I've been very involved in those, and I have three of those programs, and uh, my wife uh, uh, created a, uh, a creative writing program, or took the existing one at the University of Michigan and made it number one, and uh, again, she's very involved, and that's the way I think you make a difference. So I think my orientation has been to <clears throat> limit the number of different Almasonary efforts, but to focus them so that you could really see the change, see the difference. Uh, and that's, you know, when it's all said and done, uh, you know, we're all, you know, mortal, and uh, you, you got to look over your shoulder and say, what have I accomplished? Right. And uh, I consider this Almasonary efforts in lots of different areas very much part of who I should be and who I want to be. Okay. Um, just in the spirit of fun, uh, and then we're going to go to questions. You have a biker gang. A biker a gang. A biker gang. Yes. You want to tell us about the biker gang? Well, uh, we ride motorcycles all over the world. Um, and uh, everybody's a really good motorcyclist. Uh, the group is called Zell's Angels. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, there is nothing more therapeutic than me spending a week in my helmet. Uh, and it's one of the few times where I literally spend a week and most of the time I'm alone. And it gives me, matter of fact, all those year-end gifts, almost all of them were created uh, while I was riding. Because I had you know, hours of riding and 
start thinking about stuff, and uh, and it's very therapeutic. So when you do that, you're disconnected. You turn yep. the phone off. You just yep. Okay. And try and find the best twisty, turny roads in the world. That's brilliant. Okay. I mean, there are many. Uh, I have a thousand other questions I'd like to ask, but I think, in, in fairness to everybody else in the room, we have uh, 15 minutes left. Uh, I'd like to come back to Samisms at the end if we can. But do we, if we have the mics, if anybody has any questions for Sam, uh, now would be the time. Murray. I, I had a question about you talked about the currency dislocations, and since it appears that the uh, the U.S. interest rates are going to rise at some point in the next six to 12 months. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, current, you talked about currency dislocations being yes. a big problem. And, uh, and since the US dollar is already worth a lot more in the reserve currency, and it appears US interest rates are gonna rise at some point in the next year, while the rest of the world is probably still holding them down, that's gonna exacerbate the problem. What, what's the ultimate solution that you see for it? Well, uh, first of all, I think that the current situation is moving, in my opinion, even worse rather than better. I think we're uh, basically moving toward more beggar thy neighbor currency devaluations against uh, other currencies. Uh, you know, that didn't work in the 30s and it's not likely to work uh, in the 21st century. Uh, obviously, it requires discipline and it requires coordination. And if there's anything that would be a, 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 an appropriate definition today of where we are, it's, it's where we have almost no coordination. Uh, and I think that uh, it's in everybody's interest to uh, see if we can recreate another Bretton Woods and create stability. If not, uh, I think that you're going to see world trade continue to slow uh, as it becomes more and more difficult uh, to relate uh, currencies and values between countries. Okay, I think we have... Can you, can you share with us what you've learned from your mistakes? Can I share with you? What you've learned from your mistakes. From your mistakes, what have you learned? I didn't. What have you learned from your mistakes? Oh, oh he hasn't made any, I get it. Not to make any more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's really something, you know, you go back to uh, the 20s and there was a, a, a very famous financier uh, named Bernard Baruch and he said, his famous quote was, nobody ever went broke taking a profit. Uh, I think the most important thing that I'm focused on is I'm not too worried about how good it's going to get. Uh, my entire focus is always on the downside. And uh, if I were to identify a mis you know, mistakes, uh, they, uh, they all come down to underestimating uh, or, or under, under risking the downside. I mean, I bought the Tribune Company, uh, probably the worst deal I've ever done in my life from a results point of view. Uh, I just underestimated uh, how bad the newspaper business could get. And I promise you it got dramatically worse than any way that we could have underwritten it. Okay. Ian. I actually had this question for Candy this morning, but uh, we didn't have an opportunity. But I think you could give us a good answer. Uh, given the disastrous write-downs and penalties and eviscerating regulatory restrictions big banks have uh, been subjected to, can investors look forward to big bank equity becoming again an attractive, sustainable investment opportunity? And if so, when might that be? Big, big bank equity, will, it, will banks ever be uh, interesting investments again? Uh, first of all, uh, I, I once owned a savings and loan. And uh, that was a very challenging experience. Uh, the most difficult part about it was the idea that I was going to lend other people money at what I thought were ridiculously low rates. <laughs> and that, in effect, I thought the whole risk-reward business of being in the banking business made no sense. Uh, obviously, uh, huge banks operate on the thesis that if the number of transactions is big enough and the standards are 
kept in place, uh, then, quote, you're going to make it up on the volume. Uh, not necessarily a historically uh, uh, proven, you know, approach to the problem. Um, you know, I think that uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of regulation, uh, and and certainly the, the more regulation, uh, the less productive it's likely to be. Uh, I think that in the United States, uh, and I think we're going to see this around the world, uh, all of the changing banking standards uh, have dramatically uh, reduced uh, both the incentive to be in the business uh, and increased the risks of, of playing. Uh, or increasing the amount of equity to the point where there's no return. So I'm not a big optimist about the banking business and frankly the most creative part of the banking business, which is the smaller banks, uh, have basically in the, like in the United States, have just been wiped out. Uh, they can't afford uh, the cost of complying with all of the regulations. And uh, my guess is that right now that's just real small banks. Uh, I suspect it's going to apply to bigger and bigger banks as the regulators keep piling on, uh, you know, attempts to avoid victimhood. Okay, let's uh, we'll take one more if there, uh, back there. Sam, in light of the, uh, the drop in oil prices, um, how do you think about investing in energy? Um, I think you asked me what did I think about oil prices and where we were going in the energy area. Uh, I would say that uh, that uh, is probably our biggest allocation of capital in the last 24 months. Uh, whenever you have that big a, a, a change in, in a commodity, uh, it obviously creates enormous dislocation, but also creates a lot of opportunity. Um, despite uh, all of the you know, discussions about climate change, et cetera, uh, I don't think uh, the use of fossil fuels is likely to end within our lifetime. And consequently, uh, I think that oil, like every other commodity, is price sensitive. And if, not if I were a betting man, I'm betting that uh, what we're looking at right now in the price of oil uh, is likely to be at the lower end of the average over the next five years. Uh, I don't think we're likely to see $100 oil any time in the next 24 months, uh, but I think we're likely to see it uh, return to where it was in the not too distant future. Uh, you know, everybody talks about oversupply. Worldwide demand for oil is 93 uh, barrel, million barrels a day. Uh, we're currently producing uh, about 94 to 95 million barrels a day. Uh, so from my perspective, that says to me we have a 2% oversupply. Uh, I would remind you that I've been in the real estate business for 40 years, and I want to play any time I can get only a 2% oversupply. And I think the same thing is going to be true in the fossil uh, fuel arena. Uh, I don't expect it to you know, spike up. But if I were betting, uh, and I am, I think uh, in 2016, uh, we could easily have an average price of, of oil in, in the $60 range. Okay. So now uh, we just have a few minutes left. Um, I think, are, are these books, they're on the tables, right? You, you have these uh, little red books. Uh, the title says, A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words. These are Samisms. And maybe we can do a lightning round where we can uh, hit a couple of them. I don't know if you have any favorites, but I kind of like, well, first of all, I think just because this one's funny. Uh, That's my favorite. This is your favorite yeah. one? Uh, it says, am I being too subtle? And uh, there's a picture of a couple of people up against an army and there's a little duck saying, I think you should surrender. I don't know if you guys can see it. You can't see that, but uh, it says, I think you should surrender. Anyway, so do you want to talk, talk about I well, being too subtle? Well, uh, you know, I... Uh I hope that if I don't know what I what you know what impressions I conveyed here today, but the one that I want to leave you with is that uh, uh, I tell it like it is, uh, and that's what I've always done. And uh, I take great pride in the fact that I don't think anybody has ever left the meeting with me and said, "What did he mean?" Uh, <laughs> 
and, uh, and frankly, that, that has made my life a lot more efficient. I mean, I used to have a banker in Chicago, and he had a big orange sign in his office, and it said, fastest snow in the West. And uh, I, I found that to be an enormous advantage. Right. Because uh, when it's all said and done, uh, there's nothing better than knowing where you are as quickly as possible. So you're sitting in a meeting and you feel like this meeting is a waste of time. What do you do? Get up and leave. You just get up and leave? Sure. So I should feel thankful that you're still sitting here. That's great. Um, okay. Uh, this one I just think because it's a good lesson for anybody who's investing is uh, liquidity equals value. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the background of that one was that in 1992, uh, according to Forbes or whatever, I had a net worth uh, well in excess of a billion dollars. And it was a Wednesday, and we were closing a financing on Thursday, and we had payroll on Friday. And I realized that if we didn't close that financing on Thursday, I wasn't going to be able to make payroll. And yet, I was supposed to be this billionaire. And so what I realized was that it was all about liquidity. And liquidity equals value. Uh, and I've always you know, you know, mentored that concept and, and lived by it. And particularly after 1992, it's never been far from the front of my head. So is there, just this is not in the book, but um, with respect to liquidity today, I mean, the world is awash in liquidity. Is there anything that you, we're always worried about, you know, the black swan or whatever you want to call it. Is there anything out there that you could, you know, what would it be that could cause another, you know, lack of liquidity really quickly in this environment? Well, first of all, I think we're creating that lack of liquidity right now. Uh, if you take a look at the bond markets, uh, you have seen over the last six or eight months uh, a significant reduction in liquidity. Uh, and yet, the amount of liquidity around is staggering, uh, which says to me, that it's not a liquidity issue, it's basically uh, the institutional community or the, the buying community saying it's not worth the risk for the reward. Uh, I don't want to buy a junk, don, you know, junk bond at 6% uh, when I think the risks are significantly greater. Uh, I don't remember a time in my life where I thought that there were more potential headwinds. and. Uh, you know, and I mean, I don't know the answer, but uh, certainly Mr. Putin uh, could dramatically change things uh, very easily. Uh, certainly the situation in the Middle East uh, could get out of control. Uh, the Iranians bombed the, uh, the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, it would change uh, oil prices very quickly and change economic uh, conditions very quickly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, I guess, and you know, we haven't even talked about China, but you know, China is this giant elephant in the room, and we're all hoping that these guys are as you know, good enough to you know, win, you know, manage their way out of it. Uh, our exposure and experience to the way they handled their stock market crash uh, doesn't give you a lot of confidence that they have the ability uh, to maneuver their way in difficult situations. Right. You're not active in China, are you? Uh, we were. Uh, like everything else, uh, we went into China when, when capital was very scarce and our partners spoke English. Uh, three or four years later, uh, capital became very, very available and our partners didn't know how to speak English anymore. So uh, we haven't been back much since. Okay. Um, all right, so maybe this one, uh, trying to be right 100% of the time leads to paralysis, which probably a lot of people suffer from. Well, I mean, that's, you know, that's a classic yeah, you know, approach of uh, anybody who spends too much time you know, studying entrails uh, loses perspective on the whole picture. And uh, if there's anything that I strongly believe in, it's that you've got to start with a macro position and then refine it to micro. Too many people start at micro, and then macro screws them up. Okay. Uh, one more, which is a diversion. Um, 
because I didn't ask you and I meant to, was your philosophy on partnership. You kind of mentioned, you know, in emerging markets you have partners, but I know that you, you had a business partner. He passed away at a young age. Um, in one, some of your philanthropic endeavors you've named, you've included his name in, in um, uh, the initiatives there. Sure. And so I think that speaks volumes about your perspective, but do you want to share your view on, on business partners? And uh, Well, I mean, and to me it was very simple. I've only had one partner in my life. Uh, you know, and, and he and I were partners in everything. Uh, we shared the same risk. And ultimately, that's the definition of a partner. Somebody who you share the same risk with. So that when he made a decision, I knew that he had the same amount of risk as I did or vice versa. And that, frankly, creates a lot of comfort. Right. Okay, so I think we're out of time. So thank you for, for being my new best friend, and I look forward to seeing you at my kid's birthday party. And thank, uh, and thank and you. And seriously, for that. thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. My and, pleasure. Um, and